Good, uh, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, depending on where you are. Um, my name is um, Steve Cicchetti, and uh, I'm going to be moderating this, uh, this webinar. Um, and today what we're doing is we're celebrating the 2023 winners of the E-Access uh, Forum Research Prize. Um, this is the second annual prize that we've given. Um, and uh, and I want to thank the members of the prize committee, some of whom are here. First of all, Stefano Giglio, who is who is a uh, is going to participate, um, as well as Galina Hale, uh, Pierre Monin, and uh, Fernanda Neccio. So thank you to all of them. Um, we had a great selection of uh, of papers. It was a very difficult job for us to choose a winner. Um, oh, I guess I should say that the prize is focused on young researchers, and we do anticipate uh, we do anticipate continuing to uh, to give the prize. And this year's winner is uh, pricing of climate risk insurance regulation and cross subsidies. And I'll just say before I uh, before I continue that we're very pleased to have a paper on insurance. Um, this paper is by uh, Anna Maria uh, Tenegedjeva. Oh God, I practiced even, and I still couldn't do it. Um, and uh, S Simon O oh and Ishita Sen, all of whom are here. Um, so thank you all for joining us, and congratulations. And let me also thank you for sending for sending the paper. And I'll just say that uh, for those of you that are working on uh, climate and climate finance this year. This year's subject was really about climate finance and transition, but we chose the paper on on insurance because insurance is critical, and I think there's a there there's quite a lot to that we don't understand about insurance generally, and especially about the way that insurance is going to interact with uh, with climate with climate change because there are a lot of activities in the world that we can't actually engage in without insurance. And uh, and so we have to make sure that we structure insurance in a way that makes some amount of sense. And from the perspective of a financial economist, I think as we're going to learn, um, we're we're a long way we're a long way from that. So let me introduce the speakers. Um, Ana Maria, I believe, is going to give the primary uh, the primary presentation. Although uh, although Sanmin and uh, Sanmin and, and Ishita are here, uh, so I'm hoping that they will participate participate as well. Ana Maria is a senior economist at the Federal Reserve Board who specializes in the flow of uh, funds section. So that's something that uh, for those of us that, that look at the financial accounts of the United States, we're always thrilled that somebody's putting it together uh, because um, it looks really hard and it turns out to be extremely useful. Um, but uh, Ana Maria has a PhD in finance, which is from the Booth School, if I have this correctly, and uh, her research interests are in financial intermediation, climate change, insurance, and political economy. Um, and uh, so thank you very much for being with us. Uh, Stefano Giglio is going to give uh, a bit of a discussion after the presentation. Stefano is a professor of finance at the Yale School of Management, and he has wide-ranging research interests and accomplishments in asset pricing, macroeconomics, and real estate with a with a particular focus on hedging macroeconomic risks, um, crash risk, uncertainty risk, and climate risk, which is something that we are all uh, are all, I think, Quite interested in is worried about. Uh, prior to being at Yale, he was at uh, at the Booth School. He's gotten a number of awards, which I'm not going to list. Um, I always tell people when people start look introductions that you have to be a bit careful and not make them not make them too long and 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 too embarrassing. Um, now, um, at this point, let me just say that we always. In the eAccess Forum webinars, we always have a uh, a webinar poll, and so we're going to put up a poll, and we hope that all of you um, that all of you answer the poll, and we'll we'll look at the answers, and we'll we'll get to see them when you're finished. So here's the poll. If you could uh, if you could answer the poll, I guess I get to do it too. Oh, host and panelists cannot vote. Okay, so I'm, we're disallowed, um, and uh, that's too bad. Uh, we'll give you a minute. Thank you.
Okay, when we have enough votes, we'll put up the results. It's a really great turnout. Thank you all for coming. Okay. Time goes slowly. Um, do we have the results? We can't see them. Can't I can't see that? Are they? Are we gonna? Uh, Sachi, can you put up the results, or are they not? I don't know how to do this. I don't have access to it. Did the cost of your homeowner's insurance increase over the last two years? 64% answered yes, 36% answered no. Um, the second question is, do you believe the price of your homeowner insurance correctly reflects the level of risk you're facing? 61% answered, I believe the price I'm paying is about fair. Um, and then 21% answered, I believe I am paying way more than I should. <laughs> so that's it. Uh, well, you didn't have the, the, my answer would have been that I don't know what my homeowner's insurance costs, because, but, but that's a different problem. Okay, well, that's interesting. So, um, so I guess now we're going to figure out, we're going to find out from Anaria when, and, uh, and, and, and Sang Min and, Ishita, if it's fair. So why don't you, um, I think you can share your screen and I will turn it over. Turn uh, thank you so much for that lovely introduction, Stephen. Hopefully everybody's seeing me um, and hearing me and seeing the slides. Um, again, we want to thank so much uh, the committee for uh, awarding us the, the prize. We're very grateful and we're very grateful for all of you who have come today. We can't wait to hear your comments and a big thank you, of course, to Stefano who agreed to discuss the paper. So um, just a quick disclaimer, I work in the Federal Reserve Board, but the views expressed today will be only my own and not those of my employer or anybody working there. And just as a uh, another caveat, or I guess like a little bit of an ad time, Simon O, which is one of our lovely co-authors, uh, is uh, on the job market. So please pay attention. Uh, so without further ado, let me um, start with our motivation. Um, over the last few decades, we have seen unprecedented rise in natural disasters, which have put a uh, growing strain on firms, on uh, households, and on financial institutions. The insurance sector has been at the uh, front of these changes. Uh, it basically is the, um, the, you know, the first line of defense against these uh, changes, since it provides uh, products to protect against them. And one of the most notable contracts being sold in the United States is homeowners insurance, which, as the name suggests, uh, provides households protection against property damages. Those damages tend to be mostly coming from climate disasters, according to reinsurers. And this is a really large market. Annually, we see over 15 trillion in coverage sold, and uh, the product reaches over 85% of all US homeowners. Now, the reason why this product is so popular probably has to do with the fact that uh, for households, having homeowner insurance is a prerequisite to getting and to maintaining a mortgage. So despite the size of the market and its high economic importance, which arguably will only continue to grow as losses keep increasing, there has been done little work to understand the forces driving the homeowner insurance market. Uh, so in this paper, we study the pricing of the uh, homeowner insurance contract. And what we find is that there is a widespread mispricing. Specifically, we see that insurance prices or rates have become disjoint from underlying risk. 
And we identified state-level rate regulation as the driving force behind this pattern. So to illustrate what I mean by insurance rates getting you know, decoupled from risks, uh, let's take a look at this bin scatter uh, where using zip code level data, we plot on the y-axis, you know, rates or, you know, how much you pay for premiums for homeowner insurance in various zip codes. And on the x-axis, we have uh, our proxy for risk expected loss per housing unit. So we plot that for the most regulated states on the left and for the remaining states on the right. And let's first talk about the graph on the right. You see that basically in less regulated states, there is a strong positive relationship between risks and prices. This is what any standard model would have predicted. Insurers would like to be compensated for taking on more risk. However, if we look at the left-hand side, we see that in highly regulated states, the relationship between rates and risk is you know, almost flat, which is quite surprising. So we argue that there's two forces which are driving the decoupling of risks and rates. First, just as that left graph showed, in highly regulated states, insurers are finding it very difficult to set rates which uh, are you know, reflective of you know, the true cost they're bearing. And in those states, rates have not adequately adjusted in response to loss growth. In addition, the way insurers respond to these uh, restrictions is that they cross-subsidize their business in highly regulated states with their business in less regulated states by raising rates. And that also further leads to mispricing. So what do I mean by that? Suppose losses occur in highly, regu highly regulated California. Then what we see is that insurers who cannot raise prices in California respond by increasing prices in the less regulated Virginia. Um, in those states like Virginia, rates have outpaced the growth in losses. And both of those factors seem to contribute to the decoupling of risks and rates. Now, why is it important that you know, risks and rates are getting decoupled? Um, we can think of premiums as an allocation mechanism determining who bears climate risk. And in that sense, right now, we have a situation in which less regulated states are subsidizing the highly regulated states. In addition, uh, you know, the cost of homeowner insurance is a large fraction of home ownership costs. And uh, you know, it definitely matters for the households who pay more than their fair share. And finally, our findings raise questions about whether insurance prices can be a good uh, signal of risk to uh, guide the mitigation and relocation of people in the face of these growing um, climate disasters. So let me start a little bit, um, you know, by telling you a little bit about the institutional background. First, let's talk about what is similar across states. Basically, what is similar is the homeowner contract itself. Most households have, you know, contracts including the same features, including the same 16 risks, such as winds from hurricanes, tornadoes, wildfires, uh, hail, snow, what have you. And the notable exceptions here are the federally provided flood um, and earthquake, which is usually protected at the state level. So for an insurer to change their prices, every time they want to do that, they must reach out to the local state department of insurance and speak, seek uh, explicit approval. They must file extensive filings, sometimes over thousands of pages long, and then the regulators review these filings and um, you know, decide if that's a uh, you know, justified ask. The regulation takes place at the state of operation level. So if the insurer wants to change prices in California, Virginia, and North Carolina, they must make separate filings to each of those states. And this particular feature of the institutional setting provides us with our um, identification. We have the same insurer being subject to different regulators who have different strictness, so we can track his pricing behavior in response to different levels of regulation. 
So now let's talk a little bit about what is different. And, you know, there is multiple ways in which states differ from one another. Here it is, in, here it is a short blurb by Willemann, who are uh, cat risk, um, you know, modeling companies. In these two paragraphs talking about home insurance, homeowner insurance in California, they tell us that in this particular state, insurers are prohibited from using, for example, forward-looking models. They cannot pass reinsurance costs to their consumers. They must, in some cases, use state-prescribed methodology, be subject to very lengthy review process, public interventions and hearings. And sometimes, you know, as a cherry on the cake, you know, they ask for a rate increase, but the regulator said, well, you actually are paid too much. So instead of increasing rates, we will decrease them. So you can see that basically every state has its own very unique sets of uh, limits and limitations. Like this is California, one of the most strict states. Every one of those, you know, rules may not apply to another state. So this poses a challenge in terms of ranking states by strictness. So what we do to basically be able to rank states is we base the, the ranking on observed regulatory outcomes that incorporate the different sources of heterogeneity in itself. So what do I mean by that? We bring in new rate filings data, uh, which the insurers are making to state regulators every time they need to change rates. From those data, we extract two features. One is the target rate change or the rates required by firms to meet their actuarial goals and cover their costs. One such cost can be increased in expected losses. And another um, quantity we take from these ratings is the received rate change, which is the rate insurers actually receive after the end of the regulatory process. So if we think about the wedge between received and target rate, this is a ratio that captures the degree to which, you know, insurers are actually receiving what their actuarial goals are. And what the data shows is that the received rate is much below the target rate for insurers. So insurers get much less than what their actuarial goals are. Another thing we notice in the data is that this rate wedge really varies from state to state. So we use this average rate wedge to rank states into tertiles, into high, medium, and low friction states. Uh, and the intuition here is that in high friction states, are, these are the states that are mostly concentrated on this side of the histogram, where you know, the received rate is much below the target rate. And in low friction states, they receive almost what their target rate is. So we understand right now that all of you are asking, wait a minute, isn't this an equilibrium outcome, you know, based on the negotiation between an insurer and a regulator, you know, can't you potentially be ranked not based on regulatory strictness, but based on, you know, insurers inflating their target rate. Um, so we understand this concern. We take it very seriously. And we work very hard to show that the rate wedge is not insurer driven. So for example, uh, if indeed all we're capturing is, you know, this insurer in inflating their targets, you know, phenomenon, what we'll be seeing is the profitability in high, medium, and low friction states will be similar or in the most inflated supposedly rates, you know, profitability should be the highest. Instead, we see the opposite. The profitability truly is lowest in the states we classify as high frictions. We do many more tests to show that indeed the wedge is regulatory driven and not insurer driven. And we're happy to talk about it during the Q&A session if anybody has questions on that. But um, this is not part of the current uh, draft, but right now we are also doing a lot of work to show that the measure is correlating with some of those state rules that we briefly discussed on the previous slide. And uh, based on this rate wedge now, we have ranked states into tertiles. And, uh, you know, let's turn to empirical results. So we ask if insurance rates respond differently to realize losses across states. And, you know, we're interested what happens both when these losses occur in the state where the insurer is filing and when losses occur outside of the filing state, 
we call these safe state and out of state losses. The tests are motivated by the standard insurance pricing models, which suggest that prices are um, sensitive to shifts in marginal costs or expected losses, to demand elasticities and financing frictions. So realizations of climate losses, both when the filings are in and out of the filing state, potentially affect um, the prices through each of those three channels. For example, losses could lead insurers to update their beliefs about future expected losses. They can worsen the insurance financing conditions and they can increase households' demand for the product. So in a world without regulation, as in the standard insurance pricing model that we just discussed, we expect that rates should respond very quickly to shifts in losses, especially since homeowner contracts renew every year for most people. Um, however, if regulation is truly restrictive, we expect that rates would be less responsive. And the degree to which rates respond should depend on the extent of the regulation that each state is facing. So we are going to apply this empirical approach to two sets of data. One is the rate filings data we just briefly discussed. Basically, we have there, um, you know, for each insurer in each state in each year, what was the average rate change? And there we will be able to compare the pricing behavior in high versus low friction states in response to losses. And to address some concerns that we can address a little bit further down the road, we also bring in granular data, which is the, at the insurer zip, not state level. And uh, we explore border discontinuities there in order to be, so we should be comparing high and low friction zip codes along state borders uh, with the assumption that along the border, you know, the only thing that is different, so basically the underlying risk is the same, but, um, you know, the regulation will be different. So this granular data buys us the fact that we have this very well identified micro laboratory, uh, but the reason we also need the rate filings data is to show uh, that the results generalize and that our results have external validity. Um, so, let me first uh, focus on the rate filings data and let's look how do various states respond to same state losses. So here we demonstrate that insurers are actually restricted in their ability to update rates uh, and much more so in the highly friction, in high friction states. So we estimate the following regressions. The left hand is filing outcomes whether you file or not, and the rate you receive. And the main variable of interest here is um, losses in the filing state. So how does California respond to losses in California? And we interact that variable with dummies for medium and low friction states to allow the sensitivity to vary across state types. Uh, we include insurer across state fixed effects to make sure that uh, we're comparing the same insurer in the same state and we're not, you know, using results where, um, you know, we're estimating coefficients of the, um, you know, composition of insurers changing across time, across states, sorry. And we also include state across time fixed effects, year fixed effects, uh, to basically account for any time varying uh, state characteristics and uh, demand elasticity changing in various states. So these are the results we have. Basically, uh, what we see here is that the propensity to file increases after same state losses experienced only in low friction states by around 10%. And it doesn't move in the rest of the states. Similarly, rate received increases in response to same state losses only in uh, low friction states. So basically in high friction states relative to low friction states, insurers spread are you know, much more restricted in their ability to set rates. So what do insurers do to deal with these restrictions in high friction states? We argue that they basically engage in these asymmetric rates spillovers. We basically argue that rates in low friction states will respond to losses in high friction states, but the opposite will not be true. So how do we test for that? 
we have almost the same empirical specification, but now we introduce this term, which is out-of-state losses, which are the losses in any other state, as we already discussed. So how does California filings respond to losses outside of California? And basically, to, uh, uh, to establish this asymmetricity in rate spillovers, uh, we want to know where are the spillovers coming from and where are they going. So first, we want to know in which states are insurers actually sensitive to out-of-state losses. So to answer that question, we split, you know, we run this regression separately for high, medium, and low friction states. And what we see is that, that out-of-state losses affect finding outcomes in low friction states, but not in high friction states. And the second question is, where are, you know, these, you know, like, does it matter where the out-of-state losses are coming from, right? So to answer that question, we split this out-of-state losses term into uh, out-of-state losses coming from high, medium, and low frictions. And we show that uh, only out-of-state losses coming from higher friction states affect finding outcomes. So uh, let me just very briefly guide you through uh, the tables behind these results I just summarized. So here is um, you know, our regression results with the decision to file on the left-hand side. Uh, in columns two, three, and four, we split the filing, um, we split the panel based on filing state being high, medium, and low friction. And here we include the dummy variables. And, and what we see is that in low friction states, only, insurers are more likely to file for rate change after out-of-state losses. So out-of-state losses affect filing decision only there. Re we repeat the same exercise with rate change received on the left-hand side. And again, we see that, uh, you know, out-of-state losses increase the rate change received in basically in, in low friction state and somewhat in medium friction state. And to give you a sense of economic magnitude, after large out-of-state losses, the average insurer increases their rates by 1% in these low friction states, which is around 30% of the annual rate increase. So that is highly economically significant. Now, let's look at um, it's, you know, the other exercise in which we test if it matters where the out-of-state losses are coming from. So we split out-of-state losses into ones coming from high, medium, and low friction. And we limit the panel to only the low friction states um, by the outcomes, because these are the ones that are actually sensitive to out-of-state losses, naturally. And what we, here we have the decision to file, the rate change received. Uh, what we see is that out-of-state losses affect filing outcomes only if they're coming from high and medium friction states, uh, and not if they're coming from low friction states, which are you know, supposedly harder for companies, like easier for companies to adjust locally. So to sum up our results, you know, we have these asymmetric pricing spillovers in which, you know, the losses from high friction state flow to low friction states, but not the other way around. So like suppose that you're an insurer selling in high friction California, North Carolina, and low friction Virginia, New Hampshire. If there is a shock coming from California, uh, the California rates are not sensitive to those losses. Instead, the, um, the losses spill over to low friction Virginia and New Hampshire, but they wouldn't spill over to the high friction North Carolina. In contrast, if losses come from uh, lowly regulated states, such as Virginia, those losses stay local. They, you know, increase the prices there, but they will not spill over neither to the high friction California, North Carolina, nor to the uh, low friction New Hampshire. So at this point, uh, you may be wondering, wait a minute, maybe these results are coming because we are comparing geographically distant states with very different risk exposure. And maybe fundamentally, we are learning something about, you know, rates, this, about law distribution from California that we're not necessarily learning from Virginia, right? So to address this concern, we bring in the second set of uh, data, which is, you know, the zip code level data. Basically, now we'll be looking around the zip codes along state borders, where on one hand we have, on one side we have high friction, on the other side we have low friction states, and we're going to be comparing the rate responses there. So here we're going to have data where we'll be comparing the same insurer responding to the same shock 
for the exact same product. So the contract will be exactly the same, the same, um, the same uh, limit in maximum payout, the same house, the same consumer type. Uh, and on both sides of the border, we're going to have near identical risk exposures, but different regulatory frictions. So uh, first, let's take a look at what the summary stats look like. Among the 11 state pairs, what we see is that on the low friction side of the border, the average insurance rate is around 30 percentage higher than on the high friction state side of the border. In addition, prices grow much faster on the low friction side of the border with, you know, by 7% over the last 10 years. And with that in mind, let's just repeat the same exercise we already did, but in a little bit more stringent way. So suppose we're looking at North Carolina and South Carolina as a border pair. We look at the zip codes right along the border. And for each state pair, we identify a common shop here. And then we ask, how does the same insurer that sells insurance on both sides of the border change the prices in response? Uh, we answer that question using um, basically a stacked diff and diff event study design in you know, event time of calendar time. And what we find is that rates increase more in the low friction side than in the border high friction zip codes in response to that shock. So let me just show you the equation and the and the table results. We, you know, we have what I just said. Basically, here we have uh, you know log insurance rates for insurer I in zip code Z, which is part of border B in in event time T, and our variable of interest will be this interaction term, which is you know the interaction of whether the zip code is on the low or on the high friction side of the border. And whether this year, you know, for this particular, you know, stacked event is after the shock. As you can see from this first row here, rates on the low friction side of the border increased four to six percent more uh, after the um, after the shock took place, which confirms our same state results. Now let's take a look at how firms respond to out of state losses using this result. So um, now. You know, again, we're looking at the state border. Now we identify large shocks coming from any high friction state, which is, of course, not part of the border. And we answer for the insurers who sell in all three states, you know, how will price change in North Carolina and South Carolina based on the shock coming from, you know, this other high friction state with the shock. Uh, so we're going to be using triple dip event study design where in addition, we'll be looking into, we'll be also comparing firms that are actually exposed to, you know, the shock because they sell business in, say, California in this example, and ones that are not really very well exposed to it. So what we see is that in response to out-of-state shocks, rates increase more in the low friction side again than on the high friction side of the border. And we see that this is driven by insurers with large exposure to the shock you know, as proxy by the share they sell, sell in, the share of, you know, premiums they sell in the high friction state of shock. Again, this is the table with the results. Now we have a triple dip, which not only includes whether the zip code is, you know, on the low friction side of the border and whether we are in the post event time, but also whether uh, the insurer I is affected by this out of state loss. And you can see that by the triple interaction here that prices on the low friction side of the border increase three to 6% more. All right, so uh, I'm not gonna go into all the different alternative explanations. We're, we running, we're running a bit short. We're running a bit short of time, if, just if you, just so that you know. Yeah, absolutely. I'll just wrap up very quickly. I have maybe like five minutes more, like less than five. Anyway, happy to discuss any of these alternative explanations. Uh, I just want to highlight that uh, competi you know, some of you probably are wondering you know, how does competition play in all of that. What we see is that indeed spillovers into low friction states, which are highly competitive, is much smaller than in the states that are much less competitive. However, you know, even in less competitive uh, low friction states, the spillovers are economically and statistically significant, which means that even in high competition states, uh, spillovers happen, implying that maybe there's not 
that much competition, which is sufficient to unravel this uh, spillover. So very briefly, uh, I want to uh, turn to the implications of the rate response over time. So here is a graph showing how rates have evolved over time across states. Uh, high friction states are in red, blue, uh, the rest of the states are in blue. Uh, you see that rates have grown four percentage points lower in the high friction states, which is surprising because actually high friction states are more exposed to climate risk than the rest of the states. So this leads us to think, to, to ask what will prices have looked like in a world without this heterogeneous regulation? So we do two counterfactual exercises and counterfactual exercises will be in dashed lines. So first we want to know what would prices in low and medium friction states would look like if there were no spillovers uh, in low friction states coming from high friction states? We argue that rates growth would have been 10 percentage points slower. Next, we want to know what would have happened in high friction states if they allowed uh, their prices to respond to uh, same state losses the same way low friction states do. Uh, and we argue that rate growth would have been 13 percentage points faster. So overall, you know, what we actually saw in reality is that, you know, high friction states rates grew three percentage points slower, four percentage points slower. But in this counterfactual world without regulations, rates would have grown 20 percentage points faster, not three percentage points slower. And as a final point, very quickly, before I conclude, let's discuss, you know, so, so far we have shown that spillovers exist and they're economically large. You know, let me touch upon the remaining questions of the friction, uh, of the friction necessary to rationalize these patterns. So first, to see these spillovers, exits should be unattractive. Indeed, while exits are slightly higher in the high friction states, um, you know, however, you know, like that being said, Exits are fairly uncommon, no matter how you define exits. So we think that this is so because exits are highly unattractive. For example, that can be due to product bundling or to regulatory pressure for insurers to stay in a given state. In addition, another condition necessary to rationalize rate spillovers is that there should be a friction um, that makes insurers' optimization problem depart from region by region profit maximizations. So there are several candidates that you know we consider and we find suggested evidence that maybe the reason insurers are departing by region by region profit maximization has to do with financing frictions or capital market pressures. Um, we think in the end of the day, it's probably a combination of factors. Uh, in the end of the day, um, our central point is about the distortions in who bears climate risk, which holds regardless of what the precise mechanism that generates this pattern is. And finally, and we already discussed that, uh, states should be less than perfectly competitive. So let me very briefly conclude. We find evidence of decoupling of insurance prices from risk, and we argue that this decoupling is driven by the regulatory landscape. Uh, our findings have implications for understanding the risk sharing patterns across states. And our findings also raise questions about the long run availability of insurers, insurance, sorry, and uh, about whether insurance prices can serve as a useful signal of risk to guide mitigation and allocate, like, you know, geographical relocation choices for households going forward. Thank you so much again for um, the opportunity to present today. I'm looking forward to your questions. And once again, thanks, Stefano. We're looking forward to your discussion. Thanks very much. Before I turn to Stefano, let me just emphasize to the rest of the audience that um, that there's a, if you have questions or comments, please put them into the Q&A function. We'll do our best to get to them um, at the end. Stefano, it's all yours. Um, I think, Ana Maria, you need to stop sharing. Okay, there we go. Okay, all right. You see my screen? Yes. Yeah. Okay. So first of all, I should say it's a pleasure to discuss this paper. I've known this paper for a while, and I've seen it presented several times, and uh, it's a pleasure to discuss it. Uh, it's a great paper. It makes a very important point. It's well executed. It's policy relevant. So you know, congratulations first of all for winning the prize. Uh, let me jump into the the the, the discussion. So. 
just to frame a little bit like what the paper is about, um, you know, it's by now kind of evident to, to many that, or to everybody, hopefully, that climate change is introducing new risks in the economy and amplifying existing risks. And that the financial markets should be playing a very important role in managing these risks. They can uh, help uh, kind of the transition along many dimensions. One is in terms of mitigation, right? For example, because uh, it might help kind of uh, some uh, economic agents like home buyers, for example, internalize some of the risks they are facing. So it might, for example, as Anaria mentioned, discourage building in particularly risky areas. So it can help on the mitigation side, but most importantly, you, you know, it really should help us face the consequences of this climate change. You know, despite all the mitigation action that's going to happen, that already happened, you know, it's going to happen over the next decades, there are still going to be at least some risks due to climate change that are not fully uh, remove the you know we cannot remove from um, from the economy and so I think adaptation is going to be very important and one part of adaptation is sharing the risks in the in the in the global economy and so a key question in, in, in when thinking about this is you know how well are financial markets actually doing this job you know and how what can we make how, what can we do to make them work better so one of the interesting things about this problem of insurance climate risk is that these are very complex risks you know there's not really one unique measure of climate risk, there is a, you know, a conglomerate of many types of risks. And so we don't really have a unique instrument and unique market to deal with it. And so really the way that we are facing this problem now is we're dealing using a variety of different contracts in different markets. For example, some of the risks can be hedged or distributed via catastrophe bonds, some via you know, building, let's say, equity-based portfolios, some via derivatives like carbon futures, and some, importantly, can be uh, can be hedged via uh, insurance markets. And so insurance markets are important because they're already right now helping uh, the economy share some of these important risks related to climate change. But at the same time, they're working imperfectly. And this paper is trying to understand, you know, that like documenting one important friction is trying to understand what can we do uh, to, to fix it. Now, the, the focus of the paper is on homeowners insurance. And I think that's an important focus because uh, homeowner insurance is important for many reasons. Okay, one is of course housing, you know, represents a big source of wealth for many people. So it has, a, you know, it, it affects directly a large part of the population. Uh, it's also very directly tied to climate risk because you know houses are not very movable, contrary, for example, to firms or to other other things. And so you know they are directly affected to climate change, which is why when you think about homeowner insurance and where the losses are coming from, they are, you know, in, in vast part, they're coming from weather events, which are in turn tied to the climate. Okay. So I think it's a very important object of study. Now, and it's already insuring a lot of these risks for many people, but the, this market is also very strongly regulated. And the paper points out that the regulation, you know, could have beneficial effects, but it could also affect uh, and, and, and hinder the ability of the insurance markets to actually do their job efficiently. And that's the focus of this paper. So my review of the paper will be very brief uh, because we've already just seen 25 minutes on it. So, you know, the baseline point is that insurance is regulated state by state and many insurers are selling ins the same insurance products across state lines. And so uh, in an ideal world, you know, the, the, the prices, the, the, and the rates of insurance contracts will be different by state reflecting the risk in each location. But basically, facing different, you know, you know, the, the insurance companies face regulators which are behaving different across traits, and this induces some distortions, which you know, which the authors document. Okay. Now, the point is, this idea that that you know, we can think of this ideal world where basically there are no markups, there are perfect competition, the rates are perfectly reflecting to risks. That's an ideal world. That's not the world that we live in. That's really why we have regulation. Regulation is there to, you know, to address some issues. For example, it is there to address limited competition, is there to address some, some sort of measures of fairness within states of who gets insurance and who doesn't get insurance. So there's political economy reasons for, for regulators. So regulators do a lot of things that, you know, that potentially have benefits, but they also could induce this disconnect between the risk and the price. And so what the paper documents is exactly this distortion. They measure the strictness of states in approving rate increases across, uh, you know, the poly low and high friction states, they document the following point that you know if you have an insurer and the insurer experiences some loss in some state, they tend to ask for rate increases. There's different reasons for this, maybe because it's a signal about future losses. But the key thing is that when losses occur in low friction states, 
then typically the insurer will ask for rates increases in that state. Uh, but when losses occur in high friction states, then actually the insurers, they really can't raise, you know, they, they, because of this friction, they can't raise rates much in that state. So they go and raise rates in other states, especially in the low friction states. And so, of course, you know, the end outcome of that is the low friction states then are cross subsidizing high friction states, which, of course, is distortive and it leads to this kind of disconnect between the growth rate of, uh, of uh, risks and the growth rate of price. Um, now, the paper also, of course, you know, when you read the paper, the first thing that comes to your mind is, is like, okay, but is this really cross subsidization or it could be something else? Is it, for example, you know, insurers are learning from high. Uh, from high friction states about losses in low friction states. So really there's a learning story, not a friction story. Uh, there's differential market power potential across states. I think they do a very good job in addressing these alternative stories. So just like Anna Maria skipped it, I'm gonna skip it as well. But I think overall the picture is that I think there's pretty convincing evidence that there is some amount of subsidization that is you know, actually having an important real effect, which is the decapital risks and rates. So given the paper is quite mature and, uh, and it's probably close to publication, I think also, uh, I'm gonna try to focus my comments more on like what the paper could investigate next or you know future research papers by these authors and other authors on this topic. Um, my first thought is that, you know, I think the paper does a very good job in documenting this particular distortion, which is really an equilibrium outcome of the way the regulators behave and the way that the insurers behave. This opens up a lot of questions about, you know, why are people behaving this way? Okay, so that's, that's you know why regulate related regulators you know for example choosing rates you know approving some some rates increase and not others and why insurance companies react in particular in this way and I think it's important to really understand the fundamental drivers of this behavior of all these agents because ultimately we are trying to think about fixing policies right or potentially changing the regulation changing the way that the insurance markets are regulated for example. And if you want to understand really the final, uh, the final welfare effects of changing policies, you really need to understand how each participant is, uh, is behaving. And the paper actually does touch upon some of these questions about, you know, why do you know, insurers and regulators behave this way? But, but their view is, you know, the focus is most on saying, is that the confounding kind of story for the effect I want to document? But I think these questions are worth understanding on their own. So, for example, it looks like insurers are able to raise rates after seeing losses in high friction states, right? They're able to raise rates in low friction states. So it seems like they have the ability to raise rates if they want to. So why don't they, they already do it before? Like what's going on with like this kind of dynamic problem? They do have, the authors do have the in a, in the appendix, a stylized kind of dynamic model of price setting with market power. But again, it's kind of the, the objective is just to present, present some plausible story for why insurers behave in some way. I think that's actually very important to understand why, you know, what drives them to raise rates, for example, just in response to losses in other places, uh, and at the end, that's one kind of important I think, strategic question to understand. The other one is this, the, the the author showed that it's kind of there's very little evidence of insurance strategically asking for higher rates, basically trying to game regulators. Right? If I have a very strict regulator, I know I'm going to kind of only approve half of my rate. I'm going to ask for it twice as big. Great, and you know, there's there should be some sort of game like that. So why don't we see more of this inflation? What's going on in the game between regulators and insurers? Or another question, which I think is very important. In fact, I think is the most important question: is why are exits so rare? Like we are now in a particular environment where we see exits being rare, but we need to understand what drives exit because if we change policies, we need to understand will that actually then induce more exits down the line, right? So again, all these questions are important to be kind of kind of realistic counterfactuals. Similar on the side of regulators, okay, why regulators, why are some regulators stricter than others? My, 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 my hunch is that they're presumably balancing other considerations, like, you know, maybe some regulators care more about fairness within who gets insurance and some cares less, for example, right? Maybe there's more pressure for some, you know, from some state governments than others. And so uh, I think it's, again, very important to understand what is driving the choices that the regulators are doing in this in this context? I have a, I, I, I want to ask a question, which I think it would be useful to understand what the regulators are doing, which is what happened with the recent inflation increase. Like presumably, you know, because of inflation, there was a very good reason for all the insurers across states to ask for a raise in rates. Did the regulators approve all of these rates increases equally, or they were also strict with something like pretty observable, you know, easily observable, like inflation? Okay, so I think that 
who give some color to uh, how these regulators are thinking. Uh, and again, I think this this kind of understanding, dig, you know, digging down to the behavior is is useful. Uh, now, then my next question is really a kind of slightly bigger picture question about you know how to think about insurance markets in the sense that as you can see this the the, the of course the focus of the paper is on homeowner insurance, which is again a very important market. But I think there's an important next step to do in thinking about how these insurance markets help houses deal with climate change is that these homeowner insurance markets are incredibly short-term uh, lived, right? This insurance is repriced and which means that really is hedging the short-term weather shocks, but is actually not sharing at all, the, not hedging at all the risk of long-term climate change. You know, insurance are completely protected because if there's any news of the long-term risk are going to increase, they're just going to reprice the insurance to the extent the regulators can, they allow them to do it. And potentially, you know, we, we you know this is going to, this is going to basically, uh, is, is, is a missing mark, right? It's a market that, you, that homeowners would like to, to potentially buy, which is hedge against long-term risk and these contracts by their nature, by their short-term nature, doesn't, doesn't allow to, to do it. So I think, again, the question that this paper analyzes relates very, very strongly with, you know, why do we have these missing markets? What can we do about it, right? Are regulators trying to kind of, you know, mimic this, these missing markets uh, by, uh, by preventing rates increases, you know, is that the way we want to do it? Or we want to kind of switch the, the, the context or the market situation by, by allowing long-term contracts, for example, or try to incentivize long-term contracts. Right? So I think there's a broader picture here of what can we do to fill in these missing markets and do even better sharing of long-term risks. And then a few additional comments I'm going to be very brief on. One is it will be kind of interesting to see where else you see this cross visitation For example, is it really just about the weather or you see it in other insurance segments? And is there heterogeneity in how regulators react to different types of risk? So kind of my view was, if I have a risk which is easier to model, maybe I don't know anything about this, so maybe I don't know which risk are easier to model in the short run, but for example, I suspect flood risk is easier to model the hurricane risk because the hurricanes are rare events. And so maybe, is it easier to justify rates increase based on changes in flood risk compared to changes in hurricane risk? And how do we think about this in the strategic game between regulators and insurers? Okay, so those are all my comments. I'm gonna just conclude by saying, I think this is a very important paper. It puts kind of a focus on important distortions in, in, a, in a market, which ultimately is kind of really at the front lines of hedging uh, climate change risk. I think there's a lot more we can do, especially before we design policies based on this. But also beyond that, trying to really think in the big picture, how do we kind of fix all the various kind of missing markets that we are, or the distorted markets we see in, uh, in this context of climate change. So thank you for the opportunity to discuss the paper and uh, congratulations again. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Stefano, for that tremendously uh, informative and interesting discussion. Um, we're running very short of time, so I'm going to suggest the following. Um, hopefully some of us will, I am, I always hate it when people cut things off right at the time. So we can stay and discuss with whoever can stay with us. Um, people that, that have to go will, will drop off. There were a couple of, uh, there were, there were two sort of comments, questions, which I can bring up. Um, but before we get to that, uh, let me, let me do the housekeeping, um, as if this were the, the end, and then we're going to continue with the discussion. And that is that the, um, that for those of you that have, have participated in eAccess uh, forum webinars, you know that these are rather, uh, rather frequent. And we have one series of, uh, young scholar webinars that I'd like to advertise. There will be a, on the, the 5th of February, uh, Jan Starman's uh, from the S Stockholm School of Economics is going to present uh, the pace of change, socially responsible investing in private markets. Uh, we try to do this at uh, at noon New York time, 6 o'clock Central European time, but this will be one hour earlier. And you can register for that on the eAccess Forum website. So um, with that, I think we will continue the discussion. Um, and. Uh, and 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 we can go around with the authors uh, to try and address some of the issues that Stefano uh, raised. I think they were they were very interesting. Uh, but let me just add to that, and then we'll go around 
the two the two questions. One of them was about really about what the regulators are doing. So I think Stefano raised that already. And the and the question is sort of generally what is what is the behavior of the regulators in the various states here that might help us to understand uh, what it is what it is that we're seeing and 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 what do you think uh, the uh, the the paper authors uh, uh, Ana Maria. Uh, Sanjin, uh, Sangmin and, and Ishita, what do you think it is? The second, the second question is really uh, about politicians and how they might react uh, if they saw your paper. So, um, so that's an that's an interesting one because, of course, in if there's cross subsidization going on and you're the subsidizer, you you might not want to do it. Um, and so the question then is. What would that reaction to be? Let me let you uh, let let me let you go, and and you can decide among yourselves who, what order. Um, and uh, and and I'd I'd be very interested. I know to hear what you uh, what your reactions. Um, I guess I can take the first stop at it, since uh, you know I'll take the political responsibility for any unclarity in my presentation. And Ishita and uh, Simon can jump after me or during my uh, response. So first, thanks so much, Stefano. This is uh, very well, like all your suggestions are very well taken. We are working in follow-up work to address some of those concerns. And, uh, you know, we we may send you a paper or two to take a look at soon. Um, you know, um, so I, I just want to address like, you know, um, two questions you raised very briefly. First, why are exits so rare? Uh, again, like nothing in our empirical results documents why are exits rare. We just see that they are rare at that particular time frame. Uh, we think that there are several reasons behind it. After talking to you know insurers, that's our understanding. On one hand, regulators are you know exerting pressure. So you know sometimes you know regulators you know there was like a tweet actually from a commissioner saying hey you are about to exit our homeowner insurance market. You can't say, you can't sell auto insurance on which you're making a lot of money if you don't sell homeowner insurance, like we're gonna revoke your license. So this regulatory pressure, you know, in addition to other ways of relieving the pressure, such as, you know, bundling with other products such as again, auto uh, or, you know, just pure geographic diversification, maybe some of the reasons why in that time period exits are, less rare, but also, you know, long, like, I, I absolutely get your point that it's not clear until when can we keep companies, you know, where they are, like, you know, how long until the exits start happening much more. And anecdotally, we, I think, start to see that a little bit more. In addition, your question about why not raise uh, rates before uh, we observe losses, you know, is also very, very good question. So the way we think about it is that, you know, there's a friction making sure maximize both short-term and long-term profits, right? So, you know, basically in that case, the dynamic optimum price will be below the static optimum, which is like single periods, right? And, you know, if there is, a, you know, need for money because, you know, for example, there was California wildfires, what happens is, you know, you need to raise, you know, that, that puts you, that puts more weight on your short-term um, profitability, you know, part of the optimization. And as a result, you know, you need to re-optimize in these low friction states um, now, as opposed to, you know, after 10 months ago, uh, which kind of is uh, raising the questions of, you know, do politicians know, like, you know, why are low friction, basically the question is, you know, why are low friction states allowing it to happen? Uh, our understanding is that, you know, we're the first one to kind of document this cross subsidy going on. Uh, we think that regulators, you know, they seem to have always wondered, does this happen? But because they thought that there's sufficient amount of competition, they thought it's not happening. So in a way, uh, that's why they're letting it happen. And, you know, on the other hand, the question is, how are insurance companies actually making it happen in low friction states? And there, I think the answer is, you know, if you have much more inputs that you can manipulate in high friction, uh, in low friction states versus in high friction states, uh, I think that, you know, you'll be much more able to justify any rate you want there as opposed to in high friction states where you have like, say, two reasons to raise prices, right? Um, and I think that kind of touches several of the points Stefan raised in the discussions and the points Stephen also raised up from the Q&A. 
Thanks very much. Shall we go yeah, around? If, if, if I could just add a couple of things, and thanks so much, Stefano, for, for your discussion and uh, especially suggestions for the next steps. So just to sort of build on what Anna is saying, and I think Bernie Bernbaum uh, in the chat also asked this question, uh, that we're sort of assuming that these low friction states are um, not enforcing rules. So it's not an assumption, right? This sort of comes out of, of the empirical exercise. So this is what we see in the data. We just see that low friction states are more responsive than high friction states. Just, just, just a fact, like not an assumption. Um, and it, obviously the interesting question is why are low friction states allowing this behavior? And as Anna was alluding to, and this is an exercise that we are doing right now, um, different states allow different number of inputs um, uh, that insurers can then use to price on, right? So think of the pricing function as some combination of the policyholder's characteristics, the house's characteristics of where it's located, what sort of a roof it has, and so on. Um, different states allow different number of these inputs, and um, you just have more number of inputs that, that are allowed in low friction states. So that just gives insurers more flexibility to be able to change prices there, much more so than in high friction states. And... Um, there was one more question that maybe I can address about in the chat. I think Anna already talked about why are they doing, why are they changing prices now as opposed to, why did they already not change prices? So it's the simplest answer is that losses prompt re-evaluations and insurers do focus on short-term profits. And there are, we do find our results are stronger for in fact insurers that are publicly traded. So it seems for whom like these short-term price pressures, um, uh, profitability pressures seem to apply much more. There was one more question about insurers' inability to assess prices properly, um, and th that maybe there's some sort of a model error. Um, so that's how I sort of understood the question. Um, and so that's exactly why, you know, we want to look at what happens in response to losses, rather than just like look at the level of prices right now and say something about whether they're right or not. So that's a really hard question. We are not, not going there. So that's why we are like looking at um, prices and how are they responding to losses? So how sort of these cost shocks get passed on? What's a pass through to prices and whether that pass through is different across different states? And the other thing is also we're sort of, so the way our fixed effects work in our regressions is um, that, you know, we are able to look at, as Anna said in the presentation, one insurance company and how it behaves differently. And you would think that the ability to model stuff is sort of fixed at the insurer level. And so we are able to sort of, sort of control for that in a way, because we are like looking at this one insurance company's behavior. And really our core point is to sort of say that there is this asymmetry in response across states, so the different states are responding differently, uh, sort of controlling for the insurance insurer's behavior, controlling for a whole host of things like the type of shock uh, and so on and so forth. Um, so um, let me just stop there. Thank you very much. So I mean, would you like to add anything? Yeah, I'll just make two additional points related to Stefano's discussion. So one is, um, one of the exercises we're doing right now is in addition to looking at the specific state statutes and charters that allow differential inputs to be used, we're also looking at other business designs like personal auto insurance and see if the friction, the degree of regulation there is quite similar to other lines. So that would be getting at the question of whether this is more about climate specific or whether this is more about the regulator's preferences. And that uh, also goes with your comment on inflation. So thank you for that. And then the second point I wanted to make is about this market for longer term hedging against climate change. So Stefan is correct that uh, just by design, because these products are at least uh, renewed every year, uh, just by construction, it does not necessarily provide you with a hedge against longer term changes. That I think it brings a really important debate We uh, that's reminiscent of the debate we have for long term care insurance, because they're there was a lot of debate about why the market is so small and people were talking about demand versus supply side frictions. Uh, my personal take right now is that in, on the supply side, just forecasting future path of climate and temperature itself is a very daunting challenge uh, from, a, from an econometrician's perspective. And that forecast uncertainty probably has a, a, a non-negligible role in explaining the size of the market. Yeah. All right, thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I think this has been a really, really great discussion. Uh, Stefano, did you want to react to any of their reactions? Do you have anything more to add, or it's not required? No, I think I think <laughs> they are, you know they did a great job in responding things. Uh, I mean, I, I I agree with the points you guys made. I mean, the 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 the, 
I saw the model independent. I mentioned the slides on the on the optimal behavior. What I was trying to say is like the model is kind of suggested plausible mechanism, and I just think it would be nice to be able to just actually provide evidence that that's the way, that's the reason why they don't raise rates before. But yeah, good job. Well, but it's a, it's an, another of the we can add this to the list of reasons why fragmented regulation, uh, geographically fragmented regulation, doesn't work well. Um, so uh, we have a lot of we ha have an unfortunately large number of examples of this. Um, but uh, but anyway, I think this is really th this has been a terrific discussion. Um, thank you, uh, thank you all for joining us. Let me thank the the remaining attendees for sticking it out. Um, and uh, and we do hope that people continue to uh, to participate in the eAccess uh, forum webinars and uh, and that we we are looking forward to next year's uh, next year's submissions uh, for our prize. So congratulations to the three of you on a job uh, extremely extremely well done on a topic that's very very important. So thank you and let me all uh, let me uh, let me close the webinar and bid everyone a good morning, a good afternoon, or a good evening. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Congratulations again. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye.